Welcome back to Living History. Last week, we journeyed into the mind of Dr. Sigmund Freud, who unpacked his revolutionary theories on the unconscious, the Oedipus complex, and the primal drives of Eros and Thanatos. He shared his struggles with depression, his daughter Anna's trailblazing work in child psychoanal psychoanal psychoanalysis, and his bold claim that religion is an illusion tied to our need for a father figure. He even called social media a digital dream world, chasing fleeting affirmations. If you missed that episode, it's available to check out. But today we're traveling back to the 17th century to meet a giant of science and faith, Sir Isaac Newton. His laws of motion, universal gravitation, and his work in optics didn't just change science, they reshaped our understanding of the universe. But Newton was more than a scientist, he was a devout Christian whose faith fueled his quest for truth. We'll explore how his beliefs drove his discoveries, his fierce rejection of atheism, and the personal struggles of a man who balanced genius with solitude. We'll also ask him about Freud's ideas and tackle a Patreon question from Eric about modern skepticism of science. Let's dive in. Please welcome Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, it's a privilege to have you on Living History. Your work laid the foundation for modern physics, but your faith was just as central to your life. Before we explore that, I'd like to hear your thoughts on last week's guest, Sigmund Freud, obviously a gentleman after your time. He argued that human behavior is driven by unconscious desires, sexual and aggressive instincts hidden in the mind. He called religion an illusion rooted in our need for a protective father figure. What do you make of his ideas? Master Simpson, I am grateful for this opportunity to speak of truth, both divine and natural. This Freud intrigues me, for he probes the mysteries of the human soul, a realm I confess I studied less than the heavens. His notion of an unconscious, a hidden force shaping our actions, bears some kinship to my own view of nature's unseen laws, like gravity, which governs without being seen. Yet his claim that religion is an illusion offends both reason and faith. I have written, I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the word of God, written by men who were inspired. The scriptures are no mere projection of human weakness, but the revelation of a purposeful intelligence. Freud's focus on base desires, lust, and aggression reduces man to a culture of instinct, ignoring the soul's capacity to seek divine order. The universe, with its exquisite harmony, refutes such a view. As I wrote in my Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. To call faith an illusion is to blind oneself to the Creator's hand, evident in every orbit and falling apple. Freud's lens may uncover hidden passions, but it misses the divine spark that elevates humanity. That's a powerful critique. It reminds me of, of Burke and Payne going back and forth. Now, let's go back to your beginnings. Uh, tell us about your early life and how your Christian faith shaped your pursuit of science and what drove you to uncover the universe's laws. I was born in 1643 in Wulstrope, Lincolnshire. A frail child, my father gone before my birth. My mother remarried to a clergyman when I was but three. Raised by my grandmother, a woman of piety, I found solace in solitude and scripture. The Bible was my anchor. Its truths taught me that God created a universe of order, governed by laws knowable to man. I wrote, the scriptures are the most sublime philosophy, and this conviction guided me to Trinity College, Cambridge in 1661, where I immersed myself in mathematics, optics, and natural philosophy. My faith was no mere sentiment. It was the foundation of my inquiry. I believed God made man in his image, endowed with reason to decipher his creation. Science to me was an act of worship, a means to reveal the divine order. When I saw an apple fall in my mother's garden, I pondered why it fell straight down, not sideways or upward. This question birthed my theory of universal gravitation. I declared therein, Gravity explains the motions of the planets, but it cannot be assigned to any material cause. It must proceed from a cause that penetrates to the very centers of the sun and planets. My faith compelled me to seek these laws, for I saw the universe as a divine clockwork, its mechanisms reflecting God's wisdom. My work on optics, too, splitting light into colors with a prism, revealed the beauty of creation. 
as I wrote in optics, the colors of natural bodies are powered by the power of God's creation. Every discovery was a hymn to the creator, whose laws I sought to uncover through reason and observation. Yet my path was not without struggle, Casey. The 17th century was a cauldron of ideas. Deists saw God as a distant architect, while atheists, a growing shadow, denied his providence. I found atheism utterly irrational. In optics, I asked, Whence is it that nature doth nothing in vain? And whence arises all that order and beauty which we see in the world? Doth it not appear from phenomena that there is a being incorporeal, living, intelligent, omnipresent? To reject God was to deny the evident harmony of the cosmos. My debates with men like Robert Hooke, who challenged my optical theories, or Gottfried Leibniz, who disputed my calculus, tested my resolve. But my faith gave me strength, for I saw my work as a divine calling, not mere intellectual rivalry. Your faith clearly fueled your groundbreaking work, but your personal life was complex. You were known for being private, even secretive, and faced significant challenges. Can you share what drove you personally and the trials you endured? I was a man of intense passions, yet I shunned the world's clamor. I never married, nor sought the pleasures of society. My work was my devotion, my communion with truth. But this came at a cost. In my youth, I wrestled with sins of pride, anger, and envy, which I confessed in private writings. I once listed my faults. Having unclean thoughts, words, and actions, and dreams, and that I would set my heart on money learning and pleasure more than the true God. My faith demanded I master these through discipline, channeling my energies into study and contemplation. In 1693, I endured a profound affliction of mind, what some now call a breakdown. Sleeplessness, despair, and suspicion plagued me. I wrote strange letters to friends like Samuel Pepys, fearing betrayal. Some speculated I was poisoned by mercury from my alchemical experiments, but I believed it was the weight of my solitude and relentless labors. I was a man apart, my mind consumed by questions of gravity, light, and scripture. My faith sustained me through this darkness. I turned to theological studies, writing extensively on biblical prophecy, Daniel, Revelation, seeking God's plan in history. These works I kept private, for they were not for my time, but for posterity. My faith taught me that suffering, like the universe, has purpose, and I emerged renewed, serving as master of the royal mint and president of the royal society until my death in 1727. My solitude was both burden and shield. I was secretive, yes, for my theological views, particularly my rejection of the Trinity as unbiblical, were heretical to the Church of England. I believed in one God, not three, and wrote, The word God usually signifies Lord, but every Lord is not a God. To speak this publicly risked ruin, so I guarded my writings, sharing only my science. My alchemical pursuits, too, I kept hidden, for they sought the divine secrets of matter, not mere gold. Solitude allowed me to commune with God and truth, free from the world's judgment. It's an inspiring call to reason and faith. You were outspoken against atheism in your time, and today we have a Patreon question from Eric that connects to that. He asks, how do you feel about the increasing skepticism of science we see today, especially with social media creating misinformation and mistrust of experts? Do you think you could have still made the same impact today as you did during your lifetime regarding the scientific method? Atheism in my day was a dangerous folly, and this modern skepticism of science as you describe is its kin. A rejection of reason dressed in new garb. I wrote in my general sholium to the Principia, This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all, and on account of his dominion he is wont to be called Lord God. The universe's order, the precise orbits of the planets, the predictable fall of an apple, the spectrum of light, proclaims a purposeful intelligence. To deny this as atheists like Thomas Hobbes did, or to so mistrust in the methods that reveal it, is to turn from truth itself. You must understand, in my time I faced skeptics who doubted my laws like Hooke, who claimed my optical experiments were flawed. 
Yet I prevailed through rigorous observation and mathematical proof, as when I demonstrated that white light is composed of all colors, or that gravity governs both earthly and celestial bodies. This social media you speak of sounds a perilous tool, a marketplace of voices where truth and falsehood mingle unchecked. In my day, pamphlets and coffeehouse debates spread errors, but today's flood of misinformation seems a greater tempest. I fear it exploits man's baser instincts, something Freud would know about, pride, fear, and the herd's clamor over reason. Yet I believe truth endures, for it is grounded in God's creation. My impact came not from persuasion, but from demonstration. My laws predicted planetary motions. My prism revealed light's nature. These were not opinions, but facts, verifiable by any who followed my methods. In your time, I would still make such impact, for the scientific method, observation, hypothesis, experiment, rests on reason, which God bestowed upon us. As I wrote, truth is ever to be found in simplicity, and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. Social media may cloud truth, but those who seek it with diligence, as I did, will find it. To combat this skepticism, I would urge your world to test claims against nature's evidence, not the noise of crowds. Let experiments, not opinions, be the arbiter. As for atheism, it remains as senseless now as then. I declared, atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. To reject God is to reject the order manifest in every natural law. Today's skeptics, swayed by misinformation, risk a similar blindness. But the remedy is the same. Study the cosmos, measure its motions, and seek the divine hand. My work succeeded because it aligned with creation's truth, and that truth is eternal, whether in 1687 or 2025. That's profound, a legacy of faith, reason, and resilience. You shared how your beliefs and struggles shaped your science and your life. As we close, how do you want to be remembered, Sir Newton? And what message do you have for our modern audience, especially those grappling with the balance of faith, reason, and personal trials like you experienced? I wish to be remembered as a humble seeker of truth who saw God's hand in the universe and labored to reveal it. My laws of motion and my work on gravity and light were not ends but offerings to glorify the Creator. I wrote in optics, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yet I was but a child playing on the seashore, finding a smoother pebble or prettier shell, while the great ocean of truth lay undiscovered before me. My life was one of solitude, struggle, and faith. Yet through it I uncovered laws that endure, for they reflect God's eternal order. To your modern world I say, do not sever faith from reason, for they are twins born of the same divine source. The universe is no accident, but a tapestry of purpose, woven by an intellectual being. Study it as I did. Observe the fall of an apple, the arc of a comet, the colors of a prism, and see the Creator's wisdom. To those who doubt, I urge, test truth with experiment, not with the fleeting opinions of your social media. To those who suffer, as I did in my darkest hours, know that faith and inquiry can be your refuge. My trials of pride, despair, and solitude were tempered by my belief in God's providence. I wrote, Trials are medicines, which our gracious and wise physician prescribes because we need them. Embrace your struggles, for they may lead you to truth. Your world with its machines and voices is distant from mine. Yet the quest remains the same, to know the Creator through His creation. Seek simplicity, test rigorously, and trust that truth, whether scientific or spiritual, will lead you to the divine. I lead you with this from my Principia. The Supreme God exists necessarily, and by the same necessity He exists always and everywhere. Let that guide your hearts and minds. Wow. Well, that's it for today's episode. Newton's blend of faith, science, and determination was quite a journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please join us on Patreon. And of course, thanks to our patrons, Bob Plugfelder, Eric, who you guys heard from today, Guy and Matt for making this all possible. If you want to join us or ask a question to whoever we have next and help bring the wisdom of history to our modern world and learn in the process and have some fun conversations, join us on Patreon.